Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse, and I'm delighted that I'm still in Glastonbury because, in fact, many of the treasures are still here, and I have not had a chance to meet many of them. <laughs> I'm here today with Ishtar Babalu Dinger, who is a shaman, and I've always wanted to meet a shaman. As a matter of fact, I've always assumed shamans were men. So I'm in shock to be meeting a female shaman and also delighted. We're going to talk about her new book, The Sacred Sex Rites of Ishtar. She is also the author of a book called Lord of the Dance about her experiences with Sai Baba. She has a forum that you can go to, ishtarsgate.wordpress.com. We're going to talk about shamanic healing, about what she means by shamanic sex, healing and sex magic, what that means, what it is. Is it really airy-fairy or is it the real stuff? We're going to talk about the land and sovereignty. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Ishtar to its rainmaking time. Thank you, Kim. Thanks for that really great introduction. Thank you. My pleasure. How is it possible shaman female? What's going on here? Okay. Um, I think there are quite a few female sh shamans. Um, we call them shamans. That's why I, I hesitated. Shamans, shamans. It doesn't really That's matter. That's okay. I'm from America. I'm going to shape yeah. up here. Shaman. No, no, it doesn't. I think, <laughs> I think either or is fine. But, but what tends to happen is there is this confusion over the, the second part of the word, the second syllable of man. People think shaman or shaman means a man, but actually it's a Siberian word for someone who journeys into other dimensions and gets guidance and information from the spirits that he, he or she meets in those dimensions and then brings them back here into this dimension for their tribe and their community. And that can be a ma male or female. And when we research into archaeology, as more and more we're doing now, looking at rock art and um, that sort of thing, we're realizing that more and more women were shamans to the point that pra practically most of them at one time we're talking tens of thousands of years ago, just after the last ice age. Um, they were women. Um, and then there was this gradual over thousands of years, this sort of patriarchy came in and religion. And that's a whole other story. Um, so shaman is a Siberian word and the plural of shaman is shamans because man is not male. It's, it means something else. Um, I had no idea the word comes from Siberia. Well, I don't think most people, when they hear it, yeah. they don't know that. Yeah. I think they assume just Native American Indians from the land of the United States or something yes. like that. Yes. Although I think they're finding out now genetically many of those were, their ancestors were from Siberia around a place called Lake Baikal in Siberia. They, a lot of them came from there. Um, but the shamans were all over the world uh, um, at one time. Um, I'm talking about probably, it, I mean, it, it was kind of driven underground at different times and probably it was really, the death knell, I'd say, was Christianity, where they trashed the mystery groves in Greece. Uh, there used to be these things called the mystery teachings and the mystery rites where people would go for a kind of shamanic initiation because Plato was a shaman and so was Socrates. See, we didn't know that. <laughs> Not many people do. It's only nerds like How me. How do you know? know? Sort of... How do you know that? <laughs> it's just I've been studying it for so long. I know this completely inconsequential information. <laughs> is, I'm going to trot it all out now. <laughs> no, but... Um, <laughs> Apparently, Socrates used to stand on one leg in trance to talk to the spirits. Um, and then he trained Plato. Plato trained Aristotle, but he didn't train him in the mystery rites and the mystery teachings. So Aristotle has a much more, um, I don't know, rational, logical approach. He has that whole mystery thing missing. And that's where you start to see it fading out of, of civilization. But it was really dealt a huge death knell by the Caesars from the third, fourth century onwards, um, who wanted to bring in Christianity to solidify the empire um, as a belief system. I mean, most of those remained pagan, but they brought it in so that um, it would bring the empire together and it was enforced at, at the point of a sword. 
you know, you either converted or or you died Died. a horrible death. Terrible death. And there were at that time, we call them now Gnostic Christians. I'm talking now about 400 AD in Rome. There were lots of different philosophy schools of different people that we now would call Gnostic Christian who understood the Jesus stories as allegories, as metaphors, as myth. Um, And they were the Christians that were fed to the lions. Wow. You were an alternative health researcher and journalist, and you had worked for the Sunday Times and the Express. And I'd like you to share how the transition was from doing that work to moving into the work you're into today. Yes, it's just such a huge, I'm, I'm trying to think the best way to explain it. I was always interested in alternative health, but but more from the mind, body, spirit, the spirit bit of the mind, body, spirit spectrum, because I understood that very early on that, that we are spirits in a, in a human body and that if the spirit was sick, then the body would be sick. And it was very difficult to write that kind of an article for the Sunday Times, for instance, at that time. I think it even would be difficult now. Um, but we are in a different age now, but it was even more impossible then. And so I concentrated on the the usual therapies that, again, were new at that time to that audience, you know, like acupuncture and aromatherapy, um, homeopathy, those sorts of therapies. And I and so I would write about those and I'd go to interview people that had had these therapies and you know, got their kind of case history of, of how they'd got on with the therapy, with, with their different con- health conditions that they had. Um, and I did that as well for the Sunday Express after I left the Sunday Times. Um, but I kind of reached a midlife crisis period about the age of 45, mid-40s, the usual time that you get this. Um, and I just realized that I was, wasn't, my life was so, felt so superficial and I wasn't going deep enough and all the things that you often feel when you're going through that crisis. So that's when I went to India um, and I stayed in Sai Baba's ashram for six months initially the first time, which was just wonderful. Um, and that's where the book Lord of the Dance, you know, after I came back, I wrote that book. But I didn't want to go back into journalism. So for a while, I was just doing... Uh, jobbing editing for people. Um, editing articles or books or? Whatever anybody wanted editing. Um, I was a freelancer. So, you know, I, did, was, I was just really basically trying to earn money so that I could go on retreats and do more shamanic stuff. And not shamanic at that time. I met some shamans in India at Sai Baba's ashram, but I still didn't know that was the path for me. So I was still trying lots of different spiritual paths. The funny thing was Sai Baba said to the Western devotees, you should go back to your own country. I'm not trying to turn people, when you go back to your own country, Not he wasn't like banishing us or anything, but when you go back, you need to find the roots of your own religion because, uh, you know, this is where your strength will come from. And I took that to mean Christianity, which of course isn't our own religion. It was an import. It's a Middle East import. But for that's how I know so much about the be- beginnings of Christianity. That's why I was researching at that time. So basically I was going out to earn as much. You could earn quite a lot of money in London, sometimes £300 a day. You could earn just working, for, doing some copywriting for an ad agency or whatever. So I just work like for a couple of weeks and then I do research for a couple of weeks or, and then go back to work again. And it was just a way of supporting myself to, I was trying to find the roots of our religion, Christianity. And, and I followed it all the way back into, you know, went to Jerusalem, realized there's no historic, uh, evidence for anyone called Jesus. So I just kept going, got to Zoroastra, finally ended up in India. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I've gone wrong somewhere. <laughs> it took me two years to get back to India. So it isn't Christianity. And then it was only after I moved here that I started to connect with the whole Celtic mythology and understanding about the, um, getting to know the spirits of the land here. And all that, I was trained as a shaman during all of that, went to be trained as a shaman, finally got the message I needed to be a shaman. Um, and then I moved here from Kent. This is Somerset it's completely different here the spirits of the land here are completely different as they are wherever you go and but I found with them there they have taught me to get in touch with the kind of Celtic mythos the the myths that underlie the stories of this land and in doing that 
I'm understanding that in in that way we will root ourselves into the land and that's where the sovereignty comes from to talk about people talk about sovereignty a lot these days as it's a you know almost like a political thing claiming my sovereignty i'm going to claim my sovereignty and legally in the lawful context yeah like lawful rebellion and and lawful dissent and and freemen of the land there's lots of different groups and they're doing good work and i totally support them but my understanding is that the sovereignty of the land actually comes from the land and that the kings of old used to know this and how they would get the sovereignty of the land, how it would be transmitted to them as a spiritual transmission was through the high priestess of the temple or a, someone known as a hierodule, which is a sacred prostitute, but it's not a prostitute like we would think of a prostitute. I mean, she was highly revered because she was very sacred, very holy. And she would sleep with the king or the pharaoh um, in Egypt on the night of his coronation and therefore passed the sovereignty of the land. It would come through her like a conduit because she was a kind of shaman. Um, so I, that's why I wrote this, the sacred sex rites of Ishtar because this is a whole missing piece of the jigsaw that we don't have, that this isn't, I think it was practiced that way for a long time. It was certainly known about for a long time. Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream is actually a, a whole allegory on that. On So obviously he or whoever Shakespeare was knew about that. Um, but I think it probably stopped around that time, probably around Elizabethan times, because I'm not at all aware that the recent royal families um, go through that process. What if they do? They don't tell us about it. But but you do hear little glimpses of things. You know, there's something in the Vedic times. It was called the horse sacrifice. Um, this it called actually it was called the Maituna. No horses was actually sacrificed, but it was a play about a horse sacrifice, and they would use a mock up horse to do it. And the queen in the play would sleep with the horse. And then we hear about the uh, Empress, the Russian Empress, Catherine the Great, sleeping with a horse. These things come through to us. In We get these sort of little bits come through and we don't know what they mean. Did she actually sleep with a horse? But it actually comes from um, a very old Greek myth. It's the story of the labyrinth, Theseus and the labyrinth, and the king is Minos, King Minos. And, um, and it's the story of the Minotaur in the center of the labyrinth. Um, and at the beginning of that story, I won't go into it too much, but Queen Pasiphae, who is King Minos's wife, sleeps with a bull. And again, it's a, a wooden bull that she sleeps with. It's not like people are actually practicing bestiality and it isn't to encourage bestiality. Is it about the energy of the animal? It's just a metaphor for the transmission of the sovereignty of the land. Okay. Um, so they did it through an animal in in that at that time. I'm talking about 4,000 years ago, probably something like that. So we find it in the Vedas and we find it in the Greek myths. We find it in that myth. Um, we, but we also do find it in Midsummer Night's Dream, Shakespeare's play. It's almost like you have to know what you're looking for. And then when you know what you're looking for. You see it everywhere, but if you don't know it exists, you'll never see it. At the beginning when we were first talking, there was an important point you made about myth. Do you remember? Yes, that, that it's not history. I think I was talking about our ancestors and how they lived and how they understood their existence. And they did understand as we're, I mean, this is now coming much more into the mainstream. I think you can even learn this in universities these days, in certain universities, that our ancestors were much more shamanic in their thinking. So they had this capacity to journey into the other dimensions, just like the shaman does today. It is actually built in. We've all got it. It's our birthright. Anyone can do it. And when you refer to the word shamanic, yeah. what does that mean? Shaman is someone who can journey into other dimensions to get guidance, healing, or information and bring it back to his tribe or community. At will? Yes, because he's been trained how to do it. But it is also our birthright. Anyone can do it, but you have to be trained. There are certain protocols. And particularly as we have come away from it, for, you know, it's, I mean, shamanism 
was driven underground, as I was saying, by the Roman emperors, you know, in the fourth century. And it's been pretty much underground ever since. It's only starting to come up now. So people do need training now in how to access it. But once they've got it, then they're fine. They can just go. They don't need any further training. It just is, it's like riding a bike. Once you know how to ride a bike, you do. So it's kind of built into our software, but it, because we don't ever access it, we don't know it's there. We're not taught about it. We, I think deliberately, but you know, you could argue about whether it's deliberate or whether it's just been forgotten. But it certainly does play into the current agenda that people aren't able to access it because they are feeling disempowered. What is the role of the shaman? Shamans have many, many different roles. Okay. I think your website something about rainmakers rainmaking yeah. rainmaking time yeah. and rainmaking dot now i don't know how to make rain but i don't need to because i'm in england so <laughs> we're fine with that if i could make sun i'd be very popular <laughs> make the sunshine i'd be very popular well you know what i use it as a multi-dimensional word yeah between the spirit and matter and it's a multi-dimensional space of bringing things through from the unseen to the seen. Yes. So it doesn't really matter what the focus is in the sense is whether you're bringing in money, whether mm. you're bringing people together, where you're bringing in a solution, whether you're packaging a product or a project, whatever it is that's needed and called upon and the bringing it through, that's the rainmaking. To me, it's an ancient brand in the sense that it's always been there. It's not mine. You receive it by grace yeah. and not by force. Yeah. That's the deal. You've just answered your own question. What does a shaman do? You work multidimensionally to bring through whatever's needed on different levels, uh, according to the community you're in, to the... Um, the commitment I've made. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think some shamans are better at some things and some are better at other things. Um, there are many things the shaman always used to do. One very important role of the shaman was the psychopomp. And that would be to carry the soul of the dead at death, to carry them to their next de destination, which we call the realms of the dead, which is an incredibly beautiful place. I wish people knew how beautiful the realms of the dead are. I mean, it's just a wonderful, wonderful place. I love going there. Talk to us about it. I don't think I'm the same kind of shaman as you. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody's different. That's it. That's I it. think my role's a little different, but <laughs> mm. go ahead. Sure. Sure, okay. what you like to or what you're able to. If you want me to go into this one a bit more deeply. Or whatever you like. Yeah. Just a little bit because you said um, you, you like it so much. And I think the listener yeah. would probably be perplexed. This is one of the problems of shamanism being driven underground. We no longer understand how to die. And yet we're dying from the moment we're born. So it's not like anyone's ever going to avoid it. It's built into the software. It's no one gets out of here alive. Right. You know, <laughs> so... We're taught so many things. We're taught how to live in the world. We're taught to drive. We're, we're taught how to operate machinery. But there is now no one to teach us how to die because the shamans have been banished from, you know, shamanism has been banished from the collective consciousness. And that was a very important role of the shaman that at the point of death, the shaman is at the deathbed um, when the soul starts to rise up as it does, it comes out from the mouth. It's like a spirit and it comes out from the mouth. The shaman also goes into trance and starts to carry that soul. And it goes up and there's like a membrane that opens and you go up through that membrane. And then you're journeying. It's called journeying when you are you feel like you're just traveling. So we call it journeying in trance. And you go through several tunnels and Sometimes it's really beautiful, psychedelic. Sometimes it's really black and dark. But black isn't bad. It's just black, you know. Um, then you take them to... Well, I usually... Here's my experience, and I think others have had a similar one that I've spoken to. You come to a river, and there's a ferryman. And the ferryman takes... Usually you can give the soul to the ferryman, and the ferryman takes him along the river. But I've also been the ferryman in one situation where I had to psychopomp my father. And I actually was the ferryman in this situation and I took him along. Um, so you go along the riverbank until you come to this amazingly beautiful forest. Now, this mean, is literally? It's or in the in space? The journey, it's in the journey, but okay. You, it's not, you're not making it up, you're seeing it. Okay. It's as real as you and I talking here now. 
So it, but it's in another dimension. Wow. So you see this wonderful, wonderful forest, and it's huge. It's like the Amazonian rainforest, but it's even bigger. Um, and I, my spirits told me the first time I went there, they said, this is called the forest of despair, because just like the trees here take our carbon dioxide and turn it into oxygen, these trees take our despair and just heal the person. It just It's their food. So then the person obviously can get better just from traveling through this forest the person gets better because all the despair is lifted off their shoulders wow and then they're taken to well different places according to the what's needed but it's very much i wouldn't use the word hospital because i don't think hospital is a very attractive place especially these How about days. a healing space yeah. healing center if you ever yeah. went to a lovely healing oasis or a place like that and where they're being prepared for their next life I've never gone further than I, I can get them through the forest and to that space and then I have to go back. So I think even the shaman's not allowed to know too much further after that. But I do understand that this place is where they're prepared for their next life. And it's just incredibly beautiful and it's just all about pure, unconditional love. Are you called upon a lot to do healing ceremonies, not only on the land but with other souls? Before they pass? I had in the past done a few of those, but I've been now in Glastonbury for four years and I have a very definite uh, mission here that takes up all my time. And that's the work that we have started doing recently with the birth of the radiant child, which we can talk about if you like. Yes, please do. So what I found when I got here was that Okay, so the shaman journeys into three worlds. There's the upper world, the middle world, and the lower world. That's our cosmology. The lower world is very kind of rural, and our power animal lives down there. And also the ancestors live down there. It's very much like Somerset, if you like. You know, it's quite leafy, and and there are, there are no roads or houses, or and not that I've ever found anyway. Um, and then the upper world is much more... Okay, so then you have your spirit guide in the lower world, which is usually an animal or a half animal, like a centaur. You know, those centaurs that you see half or half horse and half man. Um, then you journey to the upper world. The upper world is much lighter. It's much more crystalline. There's lots of glass and crystal buildings, palaces. Um, and the spirit guides there are much more human or humanoid. Um, they might be angels or they might be purely human. And then there's the middle world. Now, I wasn't trained to journey into the middle world. I don't know. There's a reluctance by the shamans in the West, I have to say, if I'm being absolutely honest, to go into the middle world. Are they afraid? I think it's just they haven't been trained to do it. I hadn't been trained to do it when I got here. They know a little bit about it, but they tend to stick to the upper and lower world because it's what they know. And fine, because it does, I mean, it does the job. If you're just, if all you, you're you doing is healings for people, for example, you can you can just stick to the upper and lower world and you've got more than enough there to, to do what you need to do. When I came here, I started to get in touch with the spirits of the land and it was very much clear to me that it was middle world work. And... You know, I was quite reluctant because I just thought, oh, I haven't been trained to do this, you know, <laughs> um, and all the usual things. Oh, I'm not good enough and all that. But um, after a while of doing it, I've been, I've been doing it now for about three years. So again, with this kind of work, you often don't know what you're doing until you've done it. It's not like when you're training, if you train in physics or something, you know, you go to the class and you learn about physics and you learn about the elemental table, for example, and you learn about Bunsen burners and what they do. And then you go in the lab and you apply what you've learned. It seems to be backward in this work. You just have to trust and go along with what you think you need to do and then you realise why you did it. And, and then afterwards it all comes in of what it was. All I knew was that I had to work with the land and work with the ley lines. So ley lines are kind of energy lines that run through the earth. If you've ever been to have acupuncture. I have, and many of our listeners have. Yeah, so it's a bit like the acupuncture of the earth. The, the lines are like the meridians of the earth. 
and the standing stones that you see are like acupuncture needles and there there are other things that they use along the ley lines um which were put there by the druids or people with a druid knowledge of geomancy it's called knowledge of the earth so the um the michael line and the mary line runs through here i think that's the christian gloss that was put on them um, I think they would have originally been called something like the Lu line. Lu is the Celtic god of fire. Um, and possibly Keridwin or Bridget. That's, I'm just thinking of Celtic goddesses that might be appropriate. But we'll stick with Michael and Mary because that's what right. they are called and have been called ever since, probably ever since Glastonbury Abbey was established here um, almost 2,000 years ago. So we'll stick with that. Uh, so one is a, a male fire line. It's like a dragon and it runs through quartz crystal. And that's the Michael line. That's the male Michael line. And it comes up from Cornwall, goes right across this part of the country, goes up to Avebury, which is a huge complex, which I must tell you about because a lot of Americans don't know about well, it. Well, I had a geomancer on a little while ago uh -huh. and he shared a little bit about it, but I want you to talk about it because I think yeah. you sharing about it is also going to be a different translation. Okay, we'll come back to that. Yeah. So up through Avebury um, and then along the country and it comes out of the East Coast by Bury St. Edmunds. If people want to come onto my blog, we can give them, give them, give them. that and then they can find information about it. They can see maps of it. Sure. How it all works. So that's the Michael line. And then the Mary line, she seems to dance around him all the way along. But she takes the form of rivers, springs, anything to do with water, wells, lots of wells. Um, so this is these are the two ley lines, the fire line, the sun, fire, sun, Lu, the sun god. And then you've got water, which is the moon. So you've got the sun and the moon. And in, I'm also an alchemist. And in alchemy, there's something called the marriage of the sun and the moon. And this is what this is, the marriage of the sun and the moon, which creates life, which creates worlds. I, I understood that I had to start working with the land and, and clearing the ley lines because our ancestors always used to clear, energetically they would clear the ley lines in the way that you would perhaps do uh, space clearing with feng shui. So they would use chanting or bells or drums and they'd walk along the ley lines praying, giving ceremony. This is what the original pilgrimage was all about. It wasn't just getting from A to B, getting from one place to another holy place. It's, it's actually about clearing the land because the land, the land is alive. The land is a spirit. The land feels our feet walking, even if you were to do nothing but just walk it. Um, the land responds. They found, for example, labyrinths. Do you know about labyrinths? I've heard of them and I've seen, seen the, one. Yeah, so they've, they will put a labyrinth in a desert and people will just walk it, not with any, any particular spiritual way or with any intent. They will just walk it and walk it. And the water table comes along and positions itself under the labyrinth. And then they can make it well. Wow. <laughs> I didn't know that. Is that a secret? It's only a secret because you don't get taught it in school. <laughs> there's, there's so much that's a secret because... It's about empowerment of the human being, and it seems that the present regime doesn't want the human being to be empowered with That's remarkable. Real knowledge. Exciting. So if you're actually, even in just walking the Michael and Mary lines, you would be having an effect. But if you're actually doing it shamanically, working with the spirits of the land as you're coming along, going into trance, um, giving them offerings as well. Offerings are very important in this work with the spirits, all spirits, because you're giving an offering through the veil and then they offer something back into your life and you notice it quite quickly. So there is this, this kind of exchanges that go on. And so I started at, at the tip of Land's End, which I think a lot of your listeners will probably have heard of. It's right on the tip of Cornwall. And I, that was about, oh gosh, nearly two years ago. I didn't do it all in one go. I've done it in bits sort of thing. So I came, I've worked all, I, I've done it with, sometimes with uh, people that I'm training shamanically. I'm usually just with one person. So I have usually a trainee with me. Um, I have done it in groups as well, but I prefer to work with just a trainee and quietly. Um, it's not ostentatious ceremony because 
I don't want anyone really to notice me because it's um, you set up a reaction then with people and they want to know what you're doing and they are going to react to it one way or the other. So it's better just to quietly just do it and not be noticed. So this is what I was doing for about nearly two years. Some people feel pulled to a location and they don't know why. Yeah. Is that the land pulling them? Yeah. Is that the spirits of that land pulling them? Is that a past life thing? What is it? I'll tell you how it worked for me. I got pulled to be here. And I think a lot of people you'll meet here will say they got pulled to be here. And how it worked for me was, I mean, I had been here. I came here in 1970 for the first ever Glastonbury Festival, which was in 1971. And I was six months pregnant at the time. And there was a whole spiritual healing thing that went on, which I think uh, is why I was pulled back here when I was. So that's another long story, so I won't go into that. But when I did come back here, I was staying in a and b um, which is kind of up the hill at the bottom of the tour, but still very high up. It's called Tour Down. Um, and it looks right out over the Somerset levels, which I've since discovered so much about in the work I've done with the spirits of the land. But I knew nothing about it. I just knew it was called the Somerset levels. And I would just sit in my window for, I mean, I would usually get from, I was in Kent, so I would get here, say, about three, four o'clock, get a cup of tea or something, and then i just sit in my window, and I would sit there looking out at the levels until the sun went down, and I actually felt like I was in love. I felt like I had fallen in love with the land, and I had, actually. Wow. And they were in love with me. <laughs> <laughs> but at the time... It's getting to be X-rated here in Glastonbury. No, no I'm kidding. I know, it's true. <laughs> and I... At that time as well, I walked down the road and there were two trees looking at each other, completely in love with each other. They they were just like, you know, when that first sort of da dang you have with someone, like, not that I've had it for ages, but I seem to remember there is this kind of da dang For sure. Where you're like looking into each other's eyes and like, and that's what these two trees were doing. Uh, and I just thought, God, this place is made of love. Well, of course, you see, everywhere is made of love, but it's just the reason it's more obvious around here in Glastonbury is because the ancestors kept it up for longer here. And so that's been gradually unfolding to me that that is my destiny to bring that back here, to bring back that relationship with the spirit of the land so that we can continue doing what our ancestors were doing all those years ago. That's beautiful. Why is it, do you think, that it's a lot of times associated with ayahuasca and the taking of ayahuasca? Well, it's about DMT. DMT is contained in ayahuasca and DMT is a hallucinogenic. But we have natural DMT inside us. And the way that I teach people is not with any kind of drugs. Although if people want to do it that way, that's fine. I have no problem with it. But it's just a different way because it's about accessing your own DMT, triggering off your own processes so that the DMT can come into your brain, the part of your brain that goes into, I think it's the hypothalamus, and then onto the pineal gland. Um, and then it naturally opens the pineal gland. And then you can start to see much more multidimensionally. There's a, this is a natural thing. It's, it, as I was saying before, this is all inbuilt in us. We, we've already got the software for it. But if you don't know how to do it that way, you haven't been trained to do it that way, then you would go to a South, I think it's mainly in South America, uh, not even Mesoamerica, isn't it? They call it um, the Amazon area yeah. where the shamans are there. I think they're called Nagules, the shamans down there. And they will, they, they ingest it, the DMT. So you get this blast of DMT. Um, I wouldn't recommend anyone to take it if they weren't in that situation because I think those shamans really know what they're doing. They know about dosage. They know also they are working ceremonially with the spirits. So there is that protection set up around it. So I have no problem with what they're doing at all. But I still say I think it's better to, if you know someone who can train you in that way to have your own natural dmt it's because, kind of like the precursor yeah you know it's like in alternative supplements and all that you a lot of times want to take the thing that creates the thing yeah 
you know, you want to get to the causal level of it. So whatever it is that starts to drip the DMT yeah. gets that to happen. Yeah. That's what you want to activate. Yeah. That's what you're saying, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. But how much we're really supposed to have in terms of the volume of DMT flooding through our system, where it comes from. I know there was a movie, which I did not see yet, called The Spirit Molecule. About the name DMT. Rings a bell. Yeah. The name rings a bell. It's an American writer and filmmaker. I probably, I think I would have been put off by the title. Right. Like the spirit mark. It's a bit like at the Hadron Collider where they're looking for the God particle. You know, <laughs> it's kind of, actually the, what you, what you're actually looking for is a vibration because everything comes from sound. So it's not actually a particle or even, um, it's much more energetic than that. What, DMT? No, the precursor. Okay, the precursor. Okay. Yeah. How most shamans do it, in fact, is through the beat of the drum. Well, this is what I was taught, and I always do it this way. Um, between four and seven beats per second. Do you want me to demonstrate? Sure. Yeah. Here. So it's between four and seven per second. So it's... Something like that. But if you were good to go... That would be too stimulating. So it's about brain waves, um, and I think scientists call it. They have alpha waves and delta waves, and theta I think waves. theta. And I think they think that the shaman goes into the theta wave state. But oh, I didn't mention this in talking what I was doing in the past. But I was also a Reiki master, and we would work with theta waves as a re as a Reiki master. Get you know people would go into the theta wave state, and I don't think. That's where we go as shamans, because it's very different. Um, but that's just what science, I'm just saying what the science is saying. Interesting. Yeah. You were speaking a little bit about the birth of the radiant child. What does that mean? Okay. I was speaking earlier about something that is my destiny to do here, and that's what I've got to concentrate on. And it is around the birth of the radiant child, which is going to be quite difficult to explain without having diagrams and things but I'll do my best so there's something here called the temple of the stars which is on the land and it's made up of um, 13 huge effigies earthworks on the land in a circle which is 30 miles round and about 10 miles wide um, it was discovered in the 1920s by Catherine Mortwood and she called it the Temple of the Stars, which I think is the correct way to view it. Is it a kind of astrology? It's astrology and astronomy, but it's more astronomy. Okay. But astrologers have come along and put a kind of much more recent gloss on it of it being a star, sorry, not a star temple, so March. I mean, they do recognize that, but there is also now, they call it the Glastonbury Zodiac, and they apply sun sign to each of the star groupings of the effigies. But my understanding is this Temple of the Stars was built, and I think everyone agrees on this, long before there were sun sign zodiacs and long before the sun would be put at the centre. And it was at a time when the pole star was considered more important. And the story told of going around this uh, circle is of the, the radiant child who is born... On, around Christmas, at, on the winter solstice. Um, and then he goes around and there has different adventures all the way around. And it's metaphors, obviously, for cosmological teachings. And then comes down, you know, then he sort of... The King Arthur story is a good one, but not the uh, the really original Arthur stories, which have come from the Celtic book called the Mabinogion. Um, I can write that down for you if you... Yes, yeah, that'd be great. Um, so these are much older myths because what happened was the Christian church kind of Christianized Arthur. Um, and there's something, there's a, there's a later book which I think is a, too Christianized for it to really work. I, I'm also, I kind of think of myself as a kind of archaeologist of myth. And I'm like, if, if you look at, uh, most mythology is one story map piled on top of another because every time there's a different political imperative, then the new story man comes with the new story map and now you've got to believe this. So I try and dig under all the story maps to find the oldest one I can. I still don't think it's probably the original one, but at least let's get back to as far as we can. So that's why I'm looking at the Celtic myths. 
um, and also talking to my spirits a lot. I mean, they're guiding me in all of this. This is not, you know, I wouldn't know where to start, to be honest, otherwise. Um, so they've taught me that there is this story that the myths are telling a story of the radiant child who is born on the winter solstice, who goes on to the sign of around about March to the spring equinox, where he becomes a young warrior, and then he has to go off and earn his spurs, and he eventually becomes King Arthur when we get to the sort of summer solstice. That's where he's in, in his prime as the real summer king, um, sometimes known as the Lion King. And then he meets his lover, usually around the time of um, just before he gets to what's known as Scorpio. You see, the, I, I hope I'm not being too complicated. If you could imagine it as a clock, at around three o'clock in the afternoon. So he starts off at six o'clock in the morning. The spring equinox is at nine in the morning. The summer solstice is at midday, you know, and then he comes down to three o'clock in the afternoon. And this is, he, he meets his lover there. This is the Venus lover relationship. Venus governs those signs there. Um, and he can either stay with her and live happily ever after, or he can, he realizes he has a destiny and he has to keep going. And then if he realizes he has a destiny and has to keep going, he comes down through the death gate and that's where it all starts to fall. He's like falling down through this death gate down four o'clock, five o'clock, until he gets to six o'clock and he's actually in the underworld, it's called. Um, and when he's there, he has to go through some trials. And if he wins through those trials, he is born again, the resurrection as a radiant child. So this story is told in all the myths, but it's also told on the land out there. Um, and it's the land, I think our ancestors worked with the spirits of the land to build this story between them. I don't think it's been imposed on the land by our ancestors, the, the effigies, the great earthworks that tell the story. I don't think it's solely that. I think it was the shamans working with the spirits that, you know, they've kind of, the land speaks to the shaman and the shaman speaks to the land. And this story is what binds them together. Do you think King Arthur really existed? No. There's, I mean, even historians really struggle with that. That you know, even people that want to read myths as history, they they come up with this Prince Arthur who was in France. I think that's the best they can do. Who never became king anywhere. What do you think the whole story is about then? King Arthur and Gwendolyn? Is it? Uh, yeah, it Gwendolyn? is. Well, Gwendolyn is the Venus yes. person. Okay, but there's also conflict, right? Yeah. Conflict comes in. No, it's it's about the marriage of the sun and the moon. And it, so it's about, so when you have the marriage and the sun and the moon, see, there is a male rider figure. Did you? I yes. Think, yeah. He's the uh, fairy king. I know your, your listeners won't be able to see this, but if I show it to you on here, at least you'll yeah. get sure. it. Okay. And then hopefully between us, we can find a way to explain it. Okay. This is I, a very, I can't even very... explain to you what I'm looking at, but... Hang yeah. in there, it's rain-making time, listeners. <laughs> this is the uh, a very early drawing done by my best friend, Jerry McLaughlin. She's one of my best friends. She's a wonderful woman. She lives in London. And so we're actually, between us, trying to create, you know, a painting of this. So this is just an early sketch, and she's still working on the actual final thing. Um, but we are... Now, let's see, because you are... You may not realise it, but you are on this fairy circle... So there's the fairy swan, and that's the tour. You see the tour? Yes. And so we're around here, and that's the fairy swan. Then there's the fairy king. He's at Boltonsborough. There's the fairy queen, you know, the Venus figure that I told you about. They, on the first full moon after the spring equinox, they marry and they make love and they create the radiant child who is born on the winter solstice on is in there, December. I'm not an expert in Christianity, but is there like tentacles of like Christian myth in this too? Well, the Christians put their gloss, okay. they came here and they kind of, you know, they took over all our sacred law and transplanted their own on top of it. Okay. And so, yes, that's why it's, I mean, it's very interesting. This is on the part of the where the stars fall. You see, this matches the stars in the sky. 
So they, the ancestors understood about as above, so below. As above means that the stars fall onto the earth. So they're put here on the land where they are in the sky. So it matches. It's called being in alignment. Um, so the part where the child is born is called Cancer. It's the constellation of Cancer, which is on this part of the zodiac. Which I is hope it. we're not losing its rainmaking time listeners because they can't yeah. see this yeah. photo. I think leave we'll, yeah, we'll leave it for yeah. now. And But if they'd like to read the articles, can you, if yes. you can put the links up. Yes, uh, uh, the article will be called The Birth of the Radiant Child on the Winter Solstice. Yes. And Winter Solstice Shamanic Ceremony, December 2014. Yes. And the one that describes all this mythos is called The Mistress of Britain, The Matter of Sovereignty, and The Glastonbury Declaration. Um, because out of all of this work, we did a Glastonbury Declaration of Sovereignty. I want to ask you a little bit about the book because people are going to want to buy your book. Okay. The Sacred Sex Rites of Ishtar. What does that mean? Do you remember I was describing earlier about how the sovereignty of the land was passed to the king yes. through through a transmission from the high priestess of the temple, who was also known as a hierodule, which means sacred prostitute. In those days, we're, we're talking about 4,000 years ago, probably. That's how it was done. Um, it was done that way in Egypt that we know about definitely. And it was done that way in India, Babylon. And I think it was probably done everywhere, but we just haven't found evidence of it. You know, you're, you're always like looking pulling up these scraps of evidence, but it, you know, it's, it's difficult. Anyway, so um, this was the marriage of the sun and the moon. And so this is the same story that's being told on the land of the marriage of the sun and the moon between the king and the queen. And it produces the radiant child, which is a metaphor for this, sec this transmission of energies. So in the sacred sex rites of Ishtar, I show all the evidence that there is for this going back into... I actually get back to the Neanderthals um, in, in, you know, as far back as that and show how we can see from cave art how it was practiced. What does Ishtar mean? Well, Ishtar actually does mean star. It's the name of the star of Venus that the Babylonians called Venus. And your name, you have... I have three names. They're not the names I was born with, but um, I w went through a shamanic, something called a death rebirth initiation in 2010. Um, and it, again, I was in a journey and my spirits gave me this name. Um, so Ishtar is an old goddess of Babylon and it means star and it means Venus. Um, the Babylu bit is the original name for Babylon uh, before the Greeks conquered it and renamed it Babylon. It was called Babylu and Dingea just means god or goddess. But I'm not a god or goddess and I'm not a reincarnation of Ishtar, but I am a reincarnation of a priestess of Ishtar in the Ishtar temple in Babylon about 4,000 years ago. And at that time, we, uh, I was the high priestess and um, I was shown during this initiation, I was on my deathbed, very frail, very ill. And I was with my other priestesses and we were discussing that we knew all this knowledge was going to be lost. Um, we could see the future and we could see what was coming, you know, in, even thousands of years ahead. And so we made a vow to, in, to, first of all, put all the knowledge in something called a dreaming seed, which we buried in the other worlds, in the underworld. And we made a vow to come back now to bring it up through the cracks in the pavements as, a, as everything breaks up, as it is, all the institutions and everything. We're going to bring up this dreaming seed of the knowledge again. It's, this has been the first time in probably a good few thousand years that we can freely talk about this. And it's a very small window. People don't realize, you know, we, we all talk on Facebook and we talk on Twitter and we have all this freedom of speech, but it's not been going on for very long. Um, probably only a few hundred years that we, you know, that started uh, even then just among the intelligentsia. But to, for it actually to come in 
in a mass way has been since the 60s. And we're the baby boomer generation that came through. And a lot of us have made, uh, you said to me earlier, a really beautiful thing. You said, how did that old soul get in that body uh, or managed to get a body, which was such a lovely thing to say. <laughs> I did but, ask her that. I said, how the heck, you're such an old soul. How did you even get a ticket <laughs> to come in this time? <laughs> in that it. body, yeah. I love that. <laughs> but there's quite a lot of us here. Yeah, we are old souls, and we took a vow to come here and be here now to bring this teaching through now um, because people will be open to it. They wouldn't have been open to it before. They wouldn't have even... Uh, Cared. Yeah, it, we wouldn't have even been able to talk about it even if they did, you know. We would have been, I think, you know, you only need to look back a few hundred years to see all the various inquisitions and burning at stakes and that's gone on to keep this knowledge suppressed. And it just is, for some reason, in their interest right now to let us all say what we like, but I don't think it's going to go on for much longer. I was told there was a sacred library here in Glastonbury that yes. was either burned or pillaged or something. Kind of like Alexandria. Yeah, that's the library in the um, Abbey. Yeah, but that was about the 11th century, I think. There was, there's been two burnings of the Abbey. Well, actually, no, it's not 11th. So one was the 9th century and one was the 12th century. Um, and then, then there was a sacking of the Abbey by Henry VIII when, at the time of the dissolution of the monasteries in about 15 something. I'm really rusty on dates. No worries. No worries. I want to go back to your book. What are people buying this book to receive? In the first part of the book, I make the case for it. And, and I think people need to read the first part of the book and not just jump to the second bit, which is part two, which is the how to bit. Because which is progressive. It's a progression. I think yeah, because one step builds on the other, builds on the other. Yeah, progression, that's the word. So part two is all about how you can do it yourself. Do what? How you can access that software inside of you to practice these shamanic sexual healing techniques, which actually are enlightening. It's about enlightenment, self-empowerment. It's about lighting up something called the Uraeus. I don't know if you've seen, um, if you've seen pictures of pharaohs like Tutankhamun. He has these two snakes coming out of his head. That was an indication in the, in the ancient Egyptian times that somebody had got their, their uraeus was a light. And it's about lighting up the higher brain centers, which you do through this way of sexual healing. Um, you can do it with a partner or you can do it yourself. What's coming into my mind as yeah. you speak, and I don't want to cut you off, I want you to continue to speak, is Tantra. And Kundalini yes. and the confusion of what is what. Yeah. Can you describe yeah. what Tantra is, what Kundalini yeah. is, and if any of this relates to what you're describing? It's similar, but and I do describe in the book how it is similar, but it's different, and I explain exactly what it is okay, and, great. and why I prefer this way. But this is Egyptian, the way that I'm using, and it was given to me by my spirit guides and in the usual way of them giving, giving teaching it to me and me not knowing what the hell was going on and <laughs> and then finally getting a book which described everything that they just taught me so the so this is egyptian sex magic that they call it but i want to be clear it's not magic like it's not like putting a spell on someone it's not trying to get someone to fall in love with you that's not in love with you it's not trying to manipulate someone so that yeah. they sexually yeah. come to you or... yeah yeah right there are ways of doing that but i don't teach that right so but why do they call it magic i mean there there is a yeah. word what is magic to you the root word of magic is mag m-a-g and that's um it's actually a persian word it comes from and it that just means spiritual power so you've got the magi who in the story came to visit jesus and they really were just shamans you know people of magical power so it's been very misused magic. I think it's been deemed, the word has been demonized by Christianity. Very much so. Very they, much so. The message from them is, well, it doesn't exist. And if it does exist, it's evil. But well, it's from the say. devil. Yeah. You know, when I first began my rainmaking mission, people asked me what it was. I said, it's magic. Mm. But then I realized you can't say that. 
You know, it's the art and science of delivery. It's the yeah. art and science of manifesting. Yeah. There is a kind of magic to it. Absolutely. And alchemy to it, even though I, I could not translate what alchemy is. I don't know. You would probably translate it perfectly. Well, alchemy is just natural science. It's, it's how nature works. Nature has its own processes. The difference between alchemy and science is that alchemy builds in the spiritual aspect. It, it recognizes the energetic component, whereas science ignores that and just deals with the material. And that's why science so often goes wrong and why pharmaceutical drugs have so many side effects, you know, because if they just took the herb in its natural state, there'd be far fewer, if any, side effects. How can the world be assisted by shamanism and the kind that you're translating and bringing through? There are lots of different shamans doing lots of different things at this time. Um, so I really can't. I don't have the world plan and I don't think any of us do. It, it is a very local work. It's, we're taught to think in global terms because they want to bring in one world government, basically. So we're trained to think about saving the world, world peace. Um, but, but really, we can only fix things in our own backyard. And if everybody did that, the world would be a wonderful place. The spirits of the land are different wherever you go. They're not, they're not globalists. They're local. Um, just like certain flowers grow, thrive in certain areas of the world, um, you wouldn't expect a desert flower to bloom here um, or you wouldn't expect some of the flowers in my garden to bloom in the desert. It's, the, the, the earth... the. The, I mean, there's a lot, I don't know if you get this in America, but we get a lot here of brainwashing about diversity. Everything's got to be diversity. You've got to make it diverse. You don't have to make it diverse. All you have to do is leave it alone. It is diverse. It is diverse. It, there is no two flowers the same, even though they might be similar. There are, no, there are no two human beings in the whole history of, of human beings that have ever been the same. You know, you get people that look similar. Even identical twins are different. They're, yeah, different soul. Yeah. So we tend to think, we've been trained to think collectively. Um, and that if we think collectively, we're much more easily manipulated into different religions and then they can control us from there. Um but I train people to think individually. I train people individually. I don't do workshops. I work with an individual individually. I, you know, they come for a weekend and um, spend the weekend with me. And, um, and I work with them for who they are, which you can't do in a workshop. You know, if you've got right, a workshop too. with 30 people, it's impossible. And so we achieve so much in just one weekend the, then they can go back wherever they are and start to work with the spirits of their own land and find their own, what they're meant to be doing, find their own destiny. Everybody has a destiny. I'm not someone special. Everyone has a destiny. I'm only special because I've found mine. And you find it by working with your spirit guides in the other dimensions and learning from them. But of course, you've got to be trained how to do that. And that's all I, all I can do, all any shaman can do. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us right now? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I've covered everything I wanted to say. I could go on forever, but I of think course, should... of course, ladies and gentlemen, we have been talking with, learning from, and listening to Ishtar Babalodinga. And for those of you who would like to get in touch with her, you can go to her blog and say what that is, please. It's um, Ishtar's Gate. Dot WordPress dot com. Ishtar's Gate is the gate of Babylon. You've probably heard of Ishtar's Gate. So my kind of brand is called Ishtar's Gate, one word. In fact, if you just put my name into Google, masses of stuff comes up, and that might be the simplest thing for them to do. That would be great. I really appreciate yeah. your work. I have one last question for you, and we'll put this in. What does an initiation really mean? That's a really great question. I'm glad you asked it. Um, let's talk about shamanic initiations. If someone was to come for a shamanic initiation, because initiation generally just means an introduction to something. And we go through initiations all through our lives as we 
uh, become part of a new scheme or a new project. In terms of uh, shamanic initiations, uh, they're on a, it's basically to get, the shaman is like a bridge between, I described earlier, the three worlds. So there's the upper world, middle world and lower world. And there has to be a kind of bridge into those worlds for the new adept, let's call them the adept or the seeker, to cross the bridge into that next world. And it has to be via another shaman, because the shaman is already known to the spirits and trusted by the spirits, the, the spirits that he or she is working with. So they they're a little bit old fashioned in that way. They like people to be introduced to them. They don't want just people barging in. Um, and so, which is, I think, the psychedelic way of doing it. I, I think in the in the sixties where we were all taking psychedelic drugs and you know, the <laughs> Jefferson airplane and all of that, you know, that kind of approach was a little bit like driving a rocket ship into those dimensions. And then when when you get there, not really knowing, not having a guide, not having, not knowing anybody. It's like turning up in a foreign country and you haven't even got a guidebook and you don't know anybody. You mean like with me in England? Yeah, well, I wasn't going to mention that. <laughs> Well, you did at least know a few people, you know, here, so you were okay. But if you hadn't even known those few people, you know, it would have been very, very difficult. And the other thing is, it's about teaching people how to interact with the entities in those dimensions because they communicate in a very different way um, to how we communicate with each other. So the shaman, I, I spend some time, if it, if it was me doing the initiation, I spend a good amount of that time talking to the adept and saying, showing them, diff, uh, talking to them about different ways of what they may find when they get there and what the, the how the spirits will be towards them um, so that there's no misunderstanding when they get there and, and they can understand what they're, what, what is happening. Um, spirits often speak in rhyme, in poetry, because they're connected to that energetic way of communicating. It's an energetic, poetry is an energetic, and you'll often find sh uh, shamans like myself, for instance, also poets, because you start to understand about the power of word, the power of intention, and then the power of rhyme is also very, uh, is, is a, like a sword, and so when you, when I write poems, I can write a poem which is more powerful than a sword on a different level. Poetry and storytelling can also yes. be initiatory. storytelling as well, definitely. There are Ayurvedic medicine practitioners in India who will sometimes, instead of giving you a herbal remedy or a herbal tonic, will give you a story to read or tell you a story even. And that's the curative um part of the treatment it's there's also a book called women who run with the wolves oh yeah. clarissa pinkola estes i met her she's great did you she many years ago God, many I'd love years to, ago i'd love to meet her uh, i love her book and i've read it at different times in my life it's a great book it comes to me at different times when i need a certain healing on a certain level because those stories here those are the healing stories that were passed down through the grandmothers you know and the elders and they were meant for us to have at this time so in the same way poems when they come from if a poem is coming from the lower world or the underworld if it has that as its root source not all poems do some poems are complete sort of confections made up in the mental field and that's fine but they don't have that power but if a shaman writes a poem where the inspiration is coming from the other worlds it's almost like driving a sword from the other worlds yeah. into this one and there was an artist I represented many years ago named John Oberdorf, and when he would put paint to the canvas, when you looked at one of his paintings and he would do landscapes, surreal landscapes, you yeah. literally experienced being taken into the landscape. Mm -hmm. There's poetry like that. There's storytelling like mm -hmm. that. There's the written word like that. That's not necessarily the story or poetry, but it's initiatory. So that's why I also wanted to ask what yeah. – to you as an initiation. Yeah. yeah. The best stuff holds magical keys. 
in the language because, as I'm sure you know, the new science is discovering that everything comes from sound vibration. Sound vibration is at the heart of the atom. So everything, if everything proceeds from sound, then it's different ways of using sound. And one of the words of ways of using sound is this language that I'm at the moment vibrating certain atoms with these words in such a way that your ear is picking up this vibration and you can hear. But it's all vibration of atoms coming from the voice box. So that's certain words. In fact, that's why it says in John 1, that in the beginning was the word yes. and the word was with God. Because the ultimate source of creation is that word, is the word, is that vibration. And the Indians call it Om. That, that's their prim primordial vibration is the word that they use for it. So when you understand that a little bit more, you can start to use it. And then you would use certain words that hold certain magical keys that open up in the listener. A kind of, well, it is just actually opens up an opening within their, I want to say DNA, but it's more than the DNA that's understood by scientists. But we do carry our race memory in our energy field and the DNA is part of that. So... In that race memory, we know these magical keys and these magical archetypes and we know what they mean, even if we've forgotten for this lifetime. And most people have forgotten for this lifetime and they've been very deliberately not taught it for this lifetime as well. Mm -hmm. So, there's, you know, it's not their fault that they don't know. But still the archetypes work. And I mean, adver advertising uses archetypes and symbols and all sorts of things, but they do it in a bad way. They do it to manipulate. But a, a true healer who um, is coming from the greatest good for all and harm to no one can also do use those same symbols and same archetypes to open up in the listener, I don't know, to sort of open them up to searching for their where they should be going next if they're stuck. And they won't even know that it's happening. It's not like they understand that that's happening. It just starts happening. But things happen in there, start to happen in their lives and... You know, we were talking uh, about the subconscious mind and the conscious mind. Yeah. And it's almost like the subconscious goes, which we're often not aware of, goes, oh, yes, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. And it hears it. And then it attracts into the life things to happen that will get the seeker onto that path. So that's another kind of initiation. But the initiation I think you're most interested in is the one where the person is initiated into shamanic journeying into the how to journey into those other dimensions that the shaman visits, that the shaman goes into. And that's what I teach people to do. So I will teach them how to journey into the upper world, how to journey into the middle world, how to journey into the lower world. And I will initiate them in that I will provide a bridge for them initially so that when they go in initially with me as their you know, guide, then they can find their way through. After that, they're on their own, they're fine. They don't need me. Um, it's not like in a religion where you need a priest to tell you what to do. <laughs> Once you're in touch with the spirits, you never need anyone again to tell you what to do about anything, which is partly why it's not. It's been driven underground because it's so self-empowering. It's um, massively self-empowering. Thank you again. Okay, thank you.